You're watching the new Stack Makers, a podcast for people who develop, deploy, and manage at scale software. For more information and articles about at scale technologies, please visit thenewstack.io. Now enjoy the show. Okay, I am joined today by Florian Believe. Hi, Florian, how are you? Hello, I'm fine, thank you. You're a data engineer at Back Market. That's true. And we'll learn a little bit more about Back Market in a minute. You're also a member, or I guess, maybe not a member, but you participate in the Delta Lake community. Yeah, it's true. I'd like to hear more about that uh, in, yeah. in a minute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd also like to know about this other Rust open source community that you're a part of. But first, I have a burning question now, because I was reading a little bit beforehand, I was mentioning this to you, about uh, Apache Parquet. And based on a paper that talks about lake house architectures, and I'm curious about this story that's developing about the relationship between data warehouses which are quite traditional. Apache Parquet is actually built on Hadoop, which is interesting in itself. But what is this connection between data warehouses and data lakes, and how does that play into you know, the, the Delta Lake community? Yeah, thanks for, for the question, and uh, thanks for having me. You bet. Um, Delta Lake first was created by Databricks. Uh, it's fully open sourced under the Linux Foundation. And the primary um, needs for re providing reliability, performance, and quality on Data Lake. And Delta Lake was really um, focused on breaking walls between data warehouse and data lakes by providing more performances, more features in, into the data lake. So tell me so, what those, before you, we talk a little bit more, what are some of the barriers that where our impede the, you know, the relationship between lakes and data warehouses and uh, yeah. lake, lake house the, the main feature I'm talking about is the acid transaction. When you are thinking about relational database or data warehouse, you focus on model representations and how you structure your data. And with the data lake, you have like an open way of pushing data and put a schema on top right after. So this kind of constraint was really separated. One was data lake, many files, billion of data, and on the other side, performances and small and really constrained data models on the data warehouse. The concept of lake house was to provide uh, acid transactions, API ingestions, metadata scalability into the, the data lake to wow. make it stronger, to break walls and to have like a lake for every usage and not having a barrier between the data analytics side and the data engineering data scientist side. So I'm curious about the evolution then of this concept. And there was probably reasons that they didn't, that this, this, this capability to, you know, provide what, uh, you know, what is in Delta Lake, why it wasn't done before, right? Mm. I imagine there were just constraints in prior generations of technology that didn't allow it. I'm curious, what were some of those constraints that they just had to deal with? I think the most important thing is to focus on one part of the architecture, and the lake was really focused on providing good ingestion layers, so you can put many files in various formats easily into the lake. And it was not the same constraint as to have like really relational and, and, uh, and constrained the data model on, on the data warehouse. So they focus more on how to put a lot of files, process it, and we can think about the technology like the Hadoop ecosystem with Apache Spark, which has, was the premise of uh, Delta Lake. So Delta Lake was built on okay. top of Apache Spark. So the focus was more to process billions of data have good ingestion layers to plug everywhere and be able to write everywhere. And it was really the focus on Apache Spark. And it comes with some uh, feature missing, especially when you delete data. It's really complex because you have to read all the files previously, select the one you want to delete, and have an application, application of the delete operations. And with Delta Lake, 
it makes things easier and it was created with um, with Apple uh, the company with Databricks to provide a really um, more uh, reliable layers on top of a parallel distributed system. So how would you describe Data Lake to the data engineer out there who's listening to this show? Um, how would I describe them into the... How would you describe Delta Lake? Ah, Delta Lake, I'm, for me it's really simple. When you think about Delta Lake, you have to think about two parts. The first one is a, a scalable transaction log, which is a series of metadata files that keep tracks about data files, which are written in Apache Parquet. But it's like a protocol, you know? You can think about implementing different ways of Delta Lake. And it was done with Delta RS, uh, which I'm a maintainer, is a Rust application, the Rust software of Delta Lake. But we use the protocol to re-engineer the protocol and to have everything working with uh, Delta Lake. So basically, you have a scalable transaction log, you have a scalable data storage. You can write on different cloud providers, AWS, Azure, GCP if you want. But when you get the idea of the protocol, you can think to connect with other connectors in the Java ecosystem, in Python, in different bindings. That's why the core of Data Lake is about the, the protocol. Mm -hmm. Okay. How did you get involved in Delta Lake? Ah, it's, uh, it's a kind of story uh, at back market. Um, so we were building the ETL process to ingest a lot of various uh, data coming from the API, coming from the internal database. And all the time, we were needed to spin up a cluster in Apache Spark in our cloud warehouses. So it was really, um, it was really expensive, and sometimes you didn't require too much resources for simple use cases. And at the Mark Market, the first use case was to read Delta tables, but the metadata only, or to have small exploration with a Jupyter notebook and simple Python application. And there was no uh, application, simple one and light, available at the time. And we just look uh, on, on GitHub and we saw the Delta RS library built by Script, which was in Rust, and provide a simple Python binding. So we join uh, the effort by improving the Python binding to include more operations, more features. And it was the beginning of, of the journey with Bag Market on, on this topic. And uh, the, the library was built a bit organically, you know, it's like okay. uh, open source, people joining. It was really a nice uh, experience together because we learned Rust at the same time. It was not only about Python, it was Rust at the, at the, at the beginning. And it saved really a lot of cost to not having the, the, the cluster running, the everything, the, the time for the GVM. Rust was really optimal and efficient on memory management and CPU time. That's why it was really uh, nice for us to, to use directly at Delta RS. So uh, what does back market do? Uh, so back market is, um, is a global marketplace uh, for refurbished devices, uh, such as a smartphone or, or laptop. And we are across the world, mainly on Europe. We are in Spain, actually, and uh, also in the US. So we create a bridge between the sellers and the customers only on refurbished, because we would like to provide a way to consume uh, differently, because a lot of carbon emission is due to uh, building something new. And we would like to avoid this kind of, uh, of uh, useless uh, carbon emission, that's why by providing refurbished devices, mm -hmm. you, can, uh, you can reduce your impact carbon on, uh, mm -hmm. more generally. And so you have tens of thousands of devices that you're managing, right? Yeah. And so that complexity then is the use case for Delta Lake then? Uh, Delta Lake was really focused on how we can um, collect a lot of data internally. And for the data scientist use case, uh, we were focused more about providing the best quality in terms of devices. So we have um, an algorithm uh, which is mostly written in machine learning pipelines, which is able to select one of the best quality uh, of device that we'd like to purchase. Um, but not on the price, on the quality of the, uh, ah. of the merchant. You know, it's really important to focus ab about quality because we are refurbished, we are a marketplace. Right. So we don't have any um, uh, things 
on the building between just connect uh, devices uh, and people together. So that's why. And so, how did you personally get involved in the Delta Lake community? And you know, and when when was that? Oh, it was a, a nice adventure. It was at the same time at the back market uh, when I just looked for a Python library in Delta Lake. I saw Rust and my first uh, feeling was, okay, I don't know anything about Rust, so it may be challenging to... You're to, a Python developer? To yeah, more, yeah, more kindly. I, I did Scala, Java, a lot of different programming languages, but Rust, well, it has been the first time. And I remember sum uh, submitting my first contribution and it was to remove a character at the end of a string. And I remember spending all the night <laughs> to, uh, to face the issue because the compiler was saying, no, it's wrong. No, you are committing uh, an error. So he was really uh, friendly and mentor as a compiler, but it was really something complicated. And I, I said, oh, there is something with this because I, I really like to develop in Rust and I feel like it's, uh, it's a new way of, of developing and need to find a way to, to contribute. So I keep uh, learning and uh, contributing to the library and after uh, improving the Python binding. I spend most of my time in the Rust because I started to write Rust and becoming more a Rust developer. So it was my first contribution and uh, people at Scribd and uh, other companies were really, really nice and benevolent to help me learn Rust, help me learn Delta Lake. So it was really um, a nice community uh, that I, the open source is sometimes about, you know, it's like welcoming you and helping you uh, grow. And so you now play a role in the community managing the library? So right now I'm helping on the, I am a maintainer of Delta IRS, so I help to, to release or to focus on what's coming next. Uh, I am in the open source uh, summit to talk about how we can create Python bonding with Rust. It's something that maybe can help people to think about how they can incorporate uh, uh, Rust into, uh, into the software. So. I'm most, my, my contribution were more in the past to help the library and right now it's more about how we, I, we can provide uh, people to contribute to, to the project. And what is the name of the open source community that you're also part of with, that's a uh, law that works on Rust? Uh, the, the community is more about Delta Lake. Um, oh, this is the community. But, but right. you have also Rust communities that really uh, on on your con contribution because when you provide a data um, a data tools, you have to provide gateway to to other Rust library, Python library, so you can be in communication with different contributors. I'm thinking about uh, Apache Arrow, Data Fusion, a lot of different uh, open source uh, libraries. So. Again, the, the communities are really here to help you and to, to make any, to value any contribution. Why is Rust so important to Delta like then? What is it the value that it provides? Uh, it's a really gen general question. I think um, Rust is uh, best trade off by providing high level API while being really reliable and um, efficient on, uh, on the low level. So it's like the, the, the best of both worlds. Um, Rust inside Data Lake was because we have large data sets, large processing, and it was really helpful to manage this with a, a light library without having a, a big cluster with Spark. And more generally speaking, I think Rust is made by developers for developers, so it's like kind of boost in terms of developer productivity. It's really helpful because the compiler, the ecosystem is really efficient and you can really uh, improve the way you, you code uh, daily. Mm. So, tell me a little bit about how you see Delta Lake uh, maturing. Like, what is it that you're looking for in Delta Lake that speaks to this, you know, this new generation of lake house style architectures? I think um, right now the main uh, evolution is regarding uh, to provide a a bridge a way for different uh, standard library or data storage to communicate to each other. The latest feature communicated at the Data AI Summit was regarding uh, uniformizing the iceberg, uh, um, um, lake house, and uh, different formats that you can bring together. And I think it's really a, something powerful with the open source uh, world is to connect different formats and be able to, to read and to write from them. For me, it would be also to provide uh, helpful um, 
format or storage for the machine learning or, or AI uh, that uh, come later. So it's more about more providing tools around the Delta Lake ecosystem. Now, Delta Lake also could integrate multiple like formats for like across different projects, right? Mm. So like I got some information from you beforehand that it includes Spark, and Presto DB, and Flink, and others. Exactly. So how does that how how does Delta Lake do that? So there is a kind of the protocol which is a really um, a well structured, defining all the structures, the schema, the ways the, the the files are added to the cloud storage. But you are also Databricks is right now working on providing kernels, um, but more integrated with the connectors that would help anyone to join and to contribute to create their own connectors. That's why the, the power of Data Lake is to connect really different uh, libraries, open source one. If we take the example of uh, Delta RS, we provide bindings with Python, with Panda format, so data frame, and you can use it with uh, IWS Lambda, you can use it with different uh, DuckDB or different Python bindings. So you provide a gateway and everyone can connect to it. And that's why it's really nice when you are working on a specific cloud provider you don't want to be vendor locked in inside it that's why having this kind of standard format you can switch and you can move from one to another and don't feel stuck with one cloud provider and one format especially. i see because those projects are often often have sponsors behind them who are exactly yeah. technology companies and they're you know providing a service Based on their, on, you know, on their own expertise. So what I'm hearing is, this helps, you know, the user work between different projects, and they may want to use a service offered by a company, but they don't necessarily have to. Exactly, exactly. It was the case with back market. Um, it was to contribute to some things that we are working on on it you know it's like okay I am not stuck because I have a provider and I cannot do a feature or ask for a change with Delta Lake it was a possibility for us to say okay I will contribute and, and take an action on it so I will be active in the way that I can move with the library and it was really helpful in the in the domain instead of waiting to have a roadmap and to be stuck uh, on something or forking on our side so we prefer to join the effort on the open source community. How are you seeing the community evolve then, you know, with, with Delta Lake and what does that say about I think the interest in you know data engineering? Yeah, I think um, for Delta Lake is is moving beyond the term of data data engineering because it's really a platform to connect data scientists and data engineers. Mm. And it, it was my personal experience, but I work quite intensively as a data engineer before. I was alone with many data scientists, mm. and it switched a bit because uh, the barrier when uh, were broken and uh, we started to work together on the common format on the common platform. And it, I think it's better because in the past. Uh, I remember a lot of discussion, um, many discussions about, okay, I have this model, could you uh, deploy it in production for me? And as a data engineer, it was really complicated to not have the same language, the same tools. That's why uh, uh, working on this kind of infrastructure together, it breaks the, it, it breaks the gaps and uh, everyone is working with, on the same infrastructure. And so what are then the different use cases you see emerging uh, in the community? Um, on the community right now, they are focusing on Delta RS, especially uh, not on the Delta Lake ecosystem, on to providing many more connectors, many mm. uh, more features to improve the read and the write operation. So it's re it was really built organically, so we were really focused on what people ask. We don't rely in, on a specific companies like many different contributors working on that on when they have time to work on it. On it. So right now we are focused on the error we faced and we try to fix uh, as soon as possible. And we would like to improve the performance to, to open more gates to the connectors, but also the performance. Is, we we can, can talk about one beyond uh, of row to Bailon is, is not a problem anymore because we are still a light library with Rust. We can process a lot um, uh, Bailon of data, but we still have a limit. So that's why we will focus on 
uh, improving the data storage, the optimization of the data storage for mine in, in Delta Lake. There's other projects out there that offer connectors, like Apache Flink, for example. Yeah, it's true. What, what differentiates then Delta Lake from a project like Flink? Um, I think Delta Lake, when it was started, was really uh, GVM focused on the virtual machine with Java programming language. And for us, it was uh, the small uh, thing that we encountered on the, on the, on the performance, on the, on the resources needed when you spin up uh, a cluster. That's why Delta Lake breaks down walls with other programming language, Python, you can go Go, Ruby, have different standards, but it was not the same with different library like uh, Apache, Apache Beam or, or other computing system. Maybe it's not the case anymore because you can have light uh, applications, but uh, for us it was really to have uh, like a Panda ways of accessing data, really simple one. I want to read this, I want to read this format in my, my um, limited resources environment. So, in conclusion, where do you see Delta Lake going in the next year? Like, what are, what are some of the things you're going to be really focusing on? And, you know, and how are you going to continue to differentiate it? Uh, for me, um, I, I think Delta Lake is, uh, is quite uh, improving quite a lot recently. They provide many more uh, performance optimizations. Um, what I expect uh, from the, the standard format is to be able to not write, uh, for instance, in Parquet, but can use different data storage. It is already the case, but it's really the protocol allows you to define what will be the, the format written, and I think it could be a nice feature to add. Um, and also, I'm thinking more, more about how you can improve the, the reads from the consumer. Right now, uh, you can have the case with the latest feature on deletion vector or merge on read, but sometimes it takes time to read and to, to pay for it. Uh, that's why um, I, I expect to have these kind of features uh, available soon in, uh, in the Delta Lake uh, community. And what about yourself? What will you be looking forward to in your own work in the community over the next several months? Ah, it's a nice question. Uh, I ask myself uh, the same, actually. Um, I fell in love with Rust, so it is true. I really like to, uh, to, to do some programming with it. I, I find the, the language really nice. But I have other open source projects um, that I'm really focused on and would like to contribute. So I don't know yet. I would like to have more a position of uh, knowing what will be next and how I can contribute to it. Right now, it's more about, OK, we have a nice community. And if you want to contribute with us, come, come with us. Uh, for me, I will uh, see uh, how Rust uh, uh, will evolve uh, in terms of projects to see uh, where will be my contribution. Florian, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your time. It was really, uh, really pleasant to discuss with you. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're on all the major social media platforms. You can always find us at thenewstack.io. We hope to see you soon.